Welcome to today's Global Marathon session on how to build your authentic brand. I'm Doris Gonzalez with IBM Employee Communications and I'll be moderating today's session. We've selected three panelists who will give you a very distinct journey through their careers but also offer some very tactical advice to help everyone build their own authentic brand. Dory Clark is an adjunct professor at Duke University. She's also the author of countless of books, I highly recommend them, uh, about building brands, about reinventing yourself. It's an excellent opportunity for us to hear from Dory today, and I'm very excited to have her on the panel. We also have a Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Francis Arnold, who's professor of chemical engineering and bioengineering and biochemistry at Caltech. Judon Brown, she's very new to her career at IBM, and she's a software product manager and a graduate of P-TECH. That's an IBM-focused high school program that was created to stimulate the STEM workforce. Students can graduate simultaneously with a high school diploma and an associate's degree and be career ready. So buckle up, we're really excited to hear their stories and of course to hear your questions and stories to continue to stimulate this discussion, not just around building a brand, but building a brand as a STEM professional. So thanks again for joining. Let's hear from our panelists. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Shelley Diamond and I'm a member of the professional staff at the California Institute of Technology. Dr. Francis Arnold is the Linus Pauling Professor of Chemical Engineering, Bioengineering, and Biochemistry at the California Institute of Technology, where she has pioneered methods of directed protein evolution that are used to engineer better proteins for applications in alternative energy, chemicals, and medicine. Dr. Arnold holds many patents and has founded several companies to extend her research into commercial products for renewable resources and non-toxic modes of pest control. Her current research with her students continues to focus on evolution of new enzymes and improving protein engineering methods using machine learning. Francis, welcome and congratulations. You just received the well-deserved Nobel Prize for Chemistry in your work to go along with your other prestigious awards as well. So you're at the pinnacle of your career, and I'd like to ask you a few questions. I'd be delighted to answer them, and I'm grateful to be here. Oh, wonderful. So what did you envision your career when you started, and how different is it now than what you might have expected? Well, Shelley, life is long, if you're lucky, and it involves possibly many different careers. And I've been through them all. <laughs> so as a young person, I thought maybe I would be CEO of a multinational company. You know, I thought big. And, and, uh, or I wanted to be a diplomat because I loved to travel and I had no idea what it meant to be a diplomat. I also wanted to be a heart surgeon. Um, and then I found out the sight of blood made me sick. <laughs> so I learned things about myself. I took on many different jobs from being a taxi driver to being a waitress just to earn money. And then I discovered as I went through college things that, that really resonated with me. So the career that I envisioned when I finally graduated from college after years of working in Brazil and Italy and Spain, getting different experiences, was I was going to work on sustainability, on renewable energy. Oh, this was the 1970s when we had block-long lines of cars waiting for gasoline, there was the oil crisis, and I wanted to contribute to finding alternatives to that. My first job was at the Solar Energy Research Institute when Carter was president, and we had a national goal of 20% renewable energy by the year 2000. And then there was a change of administration and funding for solar energy collapsed, and I said, wow, I'm still young. <laughs> I'm going to go to graduate school and become a chemical engineer, work on biofuels instead. And that was really the opening of opportunities for me, was this complete pivot in the technical field that I wanted to be in. So I went to graduate school at Berkeley, 
the beginning of the DNA revolution. These right. brand new companies like Genentech were being founded and you could just smell it in the air yeah. that there were going to be big technological changes in the biological sciences. That's right. And that's where I got my background in biology. I still don't know much biology, a little bit in chemistry, still don't know much chemistry. But I wanted to be an engineer of the biological world. When I set my mind to do something, I will do my best to achieve that, if it still seems like a good idea. Uh, often ignoring advice from others, as well-meaning as it might be, or as you know, non-helpful as it might be. Uh, but I really am pretty good at, at ignoring naysayers. Right? So I was able to pursue a goal, a goal that changed, but to continue to pursue goals even when people said, oh, that's silly, or you, you're wasting your time, or it's not worth doing. So you just kept going your true north. Well, north changed. North changed, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Depending on the... On the but I didn't journey. let other people dictate the path for me. When you look back, are there any advice that you would give to yourself early on? I, I do think about that now because I have to write up a biography for the Nobel Prize. And honestly, um, I was obnoxious, headstrong, selfish. But if I had not been those things, right, if I had not followed my true north, as you say, I would have been easily swayed from doing my thing. So I, I think that a certain amount of selfishness, of taking care of yourself and your own dreams, has to go along with our natural desire to help others and take care of others. So what's my advice? I would give myself advice to be really nice to people around you, right? I wasn't always that nice to everybody. Be nice to people around you, but don't necessarily take on all their worries and problems. You're giving yourself the ability to have camaraderie, mm -hmm. right? Which is important for making sure that your life is, is more even balanced. Right. Camaraderie is important. I didn't have a lot of that as I was traveling all over the world. I traveled by myself. I worked in places where I knew no one. But that also forced me to be more outgoing mm -hmm. and to search for that camaraderie where I could find it. And, uh, but I also wrote tons of letters, which I've been going through, because I was trying to make connections with the people that I missed back home as well. And now those letters are real treasures to me, because they take me through that evolution to where I am today. Right. So you actually work with evolution, but you evolved <laughs> yourself. I definitely did. <laughs> or my evolution was directed. Right. Yeah. So now that you are a Nobel Prize winner, how's that affected your life? Uh, well, I have very little free time right now. It's still a new thing. I've sure. only been a Nobel Prize winner for a short period of time. I'm hoping the initial craziness will die down soon and that I'll have time again to devote the, to the things that, that matter to me. And that's working with young people here at Caltech, moving forward the science, which you know, now that I'm back to my roots in wanting to work in sustainability and making real contributions there. I want to keep that going and, and, and help other people solve real problems that we right. face. Right, and being a great mentor to your students too while you have all these activities. I'm sure mm -hmm. it's, it's somewhat difficult, but I know that they, they truly love you given the <laughs> celebration that was <laughs> attended. Yeah, no, they, they were so excited. Uh, truly, truly. I think we all were. We all were. So, last wrapping up, um, what do you see in your future that excites you? Is there anything that, that besides just continuing on? I'm trying to train myself not to look so much to the future, but to make every day matter. And what I, I, I've always done that through my life. I, I work on what interests me now rather than working towards some future that may or may not come. Life is finite. The people in your life that you really care about come and go. So why not do what you love to do now? Absolutely. And every day is a gift for us. It is. Yes. So thank you, Francis. 
uh, for taking the time to be with us today. And uh, we appreciate the fascinating information uh, that you've shared with us and, and know that this will be helpful to others too. Um, I can't wait to see what you, you and your colleagues uh, evolve next uh, in, your, in your laboratories. And, um, and I want to thank everybody for, for being here and, and listening to this segment today uh, because I just think it, every day is a great day when we, when we learn. Hi, this is Lori Clark. I'm here today to talk about how you can build your brand authentically as a STEM leader. And part of why this is so important for all of us to think about is that ultimately it's about making sure at a really fundamental level that people truly understand who you are and what you're capable of. But we know it's not, it's not always an easy process, right? I mean, we live in a world where increasingly every day people are getting busier, more frenetic, more frenzied. There's all kinds of talk about you know, social media and things like that. But in the corporate world, it actually gets even more intensified because there's meetings that people are running to. There was actually a study that was done by the Atlassian group that said that the average professional in the corporate world uh, attends 62 meetings per month. It's an average of about two or three meetings per day. You take that, you take email, and in between all of that, it becomes really difficult for people to even have the bandwidth to get done these, you know, the basic elements of, of what their job is, much less for them to be able to really take the time in a thoughtful and concerted way to be thinking about the people around them their colleagues, even their direct reports in terms of who is this person really? What, what talents do they have that maybe we could develop a little bit more? Or you know, how could we tap that a little bit better? Or how could we help this person create the kind of career and career trajectory that would be the best thing for her? Other people, unfortunately, don't really have the time or at least don't really take the time to be thinking about those things. And so that is why especially early in your, in your career, it's really important for you to be thinking about this. You need to be your own best advocate. And that involves really understanding who you are, where you want to go, and getting clear and getting good at conveying that value to other people. But of course, right, there's a little bit of a of a trick to the process because when we talk about this when we talk about you know building your brand and what's your personal brand a lot of times people get a picture like this in their heads which is oh god i don't want to be like this guy i don't want to be like you know mr car salesman hey you know buy what i've got nobody wants to be thought of as that obnoxious person that's always selling themselves and always trying to be, you know, thumping their chest and talking about how great they are, obviously, right? Nobody likes those people. Nobody wants to be that person. And so for some people, especially, uh, you know, especially women sometimes who are, you know, brought up culturally to want to be likable and to be liked, it, it's really hard because it sometimes feels like a very fraught position where you only have two choices, either kind of keep quiet and just try to do your thing or be the obnoxious person that nobody really wants to be anyway. And so part of why I wanted to talk with you guys today is to let you know that there is a third way. I have done a lot of research on these topics. I actually wrote a wrote a book a few years ago called Reinventing You, which is about personal branding. I teach for the Fuqua School of Business at Duke. So I spent a lot of time thinking about and researching and talking about questions of how to build your brand effectively as a leader. And I want you to know it does not have to be like the car salesman guy. That's actually a caricature of personal branding. That is personal branding done badly. And so in order to talk a little bit about how to do it the right way, I wanted to take a, take a zoom back historically and look at this. This is the cover story from Fast Company magazine from just about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago. It was from 1997. And this was the first time that the term personal branding was used in the contemporary business media. Uh, so it's, you know, this article, The Brand Called You. And fundamentally, though, even though the term personal brand is 20 years old, the concept is not 20 years old. The concept, this is the key thing to know, the concept is millennia old. Because fundamentally what we're talking about, personal brand might be a modern coinage, 
But what we're really talking about is what is your reputation? How do people think of you? And is it how you would want them to think about you? That's all it is. And so if, if we are just a little bit strategic about that, about understanding you know, who we are, making sure that that message gets through in a loud and clear way, that makes us so much more prepared than most other people, than most of the, the rest of the competition, because other people are not thinking about that. They're not thinking strategically. And so it's a, a really powerful way to set yourself apart. So what I wanted to do in the brief time that we have together is to share with you five really hopefully clear tactical things that you can do, things you can do starting today that will help you with building your brand authentically as a leader in the STEM field. So let's, let's dive into this, these five strategies to become an effective, authentic STEM leader. And, you know, this is a little bit of a smorgasbord, right? So don't, don't feel like, oh my gosh, I have to, I have to do all of these things. I have all this homework now. It's not like that. Uh, the goal, I mean, certainly do all of them if you would like, but the goal is for you as you're listening to think of at least one just if there's even one that resonates with you is something that you know what I think I can try that I think I can do that it is my hope and certainly the research backs this up that doing so will make you more effective so let's dive in so the first one is something that I uh, wrote about in my first book reinventing you and it's really simple and kind of fun honestly kind of a fun exercise uh, it's called the three-word exercise and it goes like this because when it comes to personal branding, the first, the first step, as you might imagine, is understanding what your brand currently is. Because of course, it's not, it's not like you're inventing a brand out of whole cloth. Everybody, everybody has some kind of a brand, meaning people think something about you right now. The only question is, what is it? So a really good starting point, if you want to be strategic about your brand, is to understand, well, what do they think now? So the three-word exercise helps you understand that. Um, so the basic idea, over the course of the next week or the next few days, reach out to about half a dozen people who know you reasonably well. These can be friends, these can be uh, you know, colleagues of some kind, and you ask them a really simple question, which is, if you had to describe me in only three words, what would they be? Right? And make sure that you write down what people say because it gets easy over time to kind of forget exactly what they said. So write down the exact words. Now, what's exciting about this is it's not probably that they're going to tell you something that you've never heard in your life or you've never thought of in your life. But what you're going to see is a pattern because odds are you are going to really see by the time you get to the fourth, the fifth person that there's, there's kind of a grouping, there's a commonality of how people think about you. And that is really powerful because it begins to show you a strength that you have that you can really build on. Because the, the problem isn't that you don't know who you are. You know, you probably have a sense of that, of course. But the issue is that it's hard for us to know what other people think is most special or most memorable or most distinctive about us. In this exercise, getting people to boil you down into three simple words, that's what it does. So that is something that I will suggest to you. It's kind of a cool way to get a pulse on how you are viewed now. That's number one. So the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about is the concept of executive presence. Now, this is something that uh, a lot of research has been done by the Center for Talent Innovation, which is a think tank in New York. Now, you may have heard the term executive presence. It, it often gets thrown around, frankly, as a way of justifying who advances in an organization and who doesn't, right? It's kind of amorphous. It's like, well, you know, she has executive presence and she doesn't. Well, you know, what does that mean? I mean, basically, if, in a literal sense, it's like, oh, well, she looks like a leader and this other one doesn't. That's, that's pretty squiggly, right? How do you make sure that you're the one that looks like a leader? Well, that's what the Center for, for uh, Talent Innovation wanted to focus in on. When people use the phrase executive presence, what do they mean? Right? What does that even look like? So what they discovered, they did a big, wide-ranging survey, and what they discovered is that when people talk about executive presence, fundamentally they mean three things. And so if you want to advance in an organization, if you focus on these three things, that can really help your brand as a leader. It can, it can signal to people, oh, she's someone to watch out for. And the three things, just briefly, 
number one, this is small though, this is about 10% of the total, is your appearance. So that means are you dressed professionally? Are you looking like you're sort of ready for the job? So, you know, you all know this, right? Like dress in a responsible professional manner. That That is essential, but it's a small piece. The two bigger pieces, which I want to urge you guys to think about, the, you know, one of the biggest ones is communication skills. Are you an effective speaker, especially a presenter, public speaking? If this is an area that's weak for you, focus on that. Take the class, take the, the Toastmasters, because it's a way for you to really demonstrate by being a powerful speaker that you are ready to lead. So that is a, a great thing that you can focus in on and skill you can develop. And for gravitas, what they mean by that basically is in a moment of crisis, are you someone that people feel like they can count on? Are you somebody who keeps a cool head in the midst of crisis? If you are, that marks you as a leader. So cultivating those skills can make a really big difference. That's number two. Number three, a story that I tell in my book, Reinventing You, is about this woman. Her name is Joanne Chang. What I love about her story, Joanne um, actually entered a, a new career for herself. She had, she had worked for a while as a management consultant, decided she, didn't, decided she didn't like it, but she wanted to enter a new field that she had no training in. She wanted to be a chef. And, you know, why would somebody hire somebody as, as an aspiring chef with, with no training, no credentials? But what she did, which was genius, was she didn't just look for job openings and, and say, oh, I guess I'll apply for that. I guess I'll apply for that. If you do that, you're in the slush pile. You're, you're just undifferentiated. What she did instead, she started from a different place and she asked for what she wanted. She made a list of the top dozen chefs that she admired in her city and she wrote them personal letters, letting them know why she admired them and what she could bring to the table. And she said, look, I know I don't have experience doing this, but I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to try anything. I have these other skills I can bring to the table because she had been a management consultant. She had a lot to offer. And the first chef who got her letter saw it and said, you know what? I'll give her a chance. And so within a week, Joanne had her first job. She's subsequently gone on to have an illustrious career. She's won James Beard Awards, which is the highest award in the industry. She now owns four bakeries and a restaurant. Uh, she's very successful, but it started because she wasn't just passively waiting for opportunities to come to her. She saw what she wanted. She saw who she wanted to work with and learn from. She raised her hand and said, how about you consider me? And it worked. So asking for what you're, you want is key. Now, another thing that as we think about our personal brand is really important for us, um, especially if we're talking about underrepresented minorities, such as women, in STEM, is the concept of covering. Now, this is something that I wrote a piece about with a, a colleague of mine, Christy Smith, in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, there was research done on this by Kenji Yoshino at NYU and the Deloitte Leadership Center for Inclusion. And the basic idea of covering is that Ultimately, it's, it's this, unfortunately, kind of pervasive practice in a lot of uh, the corporate world where people who are different in some way feel like they have to try to make a conscious, active effort to minimize those differences, that they need to play them down. So it could be anything from a person from a different cultural background feeling like they kind of have to tamp that down and not talk about it at work. Maybe if you're a parent or especially maybe a single parent, you feel like, okay, I better not mention that so that people know that I'm uh, you know, serious about my job. But it affects almost everybody. It turns out that about two-thirds of workers feel like they, they need to cover in some way, even straight white men who may be encountering some kind of a health issue or a mental health issue. They feel like they need to, to really actively monitor it and keep it silent. 45% of straight white men feel like they have to do it. And you know, the numbers just get higher for women. Uh, over 80% of LGBT people feel they have to cover in some way. The research shows that, unfortunately, that's actually really damaging because the more psychological energy that you expend worrying about, oh my gosh, what do they think of me? What's going on? It means that it's less bandwidth to focus on your job. So really making an effort to say, you know what? I am comfortable being me. I am not going to cover. And by, and by doing that, by being my authentic self, I am implicitly giving permission to other people to be a role model for other people that it's okay to be themselves. That is a powerful thing to do. 
Finally, one that I wanted to talk with you guys about is the concept of getting a wingman, or for that matter, a wing woman. <laughs> so this is from research done by Robert Cialdini at Arizona State and Jeffrey Pfeffer at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And it says that basically, as you might imagine, if you were just to tell somebody, hey, blah, 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 I'm so great, they're going to tune out really fast, right? They're not going to listen to that. But the amazing thing is that if somebody else if somebody else, even your friend, does the same thing for you, if they say, oh, Dory's so great, let me tell you about Dory and why you should get to know Dory, people will listen to that third party and say, oh my gosh, Dory is great, I better get to know Dory. And so, of course, this happens organically by accident sometimes, but you can also make it happen. So think about finding a trusted friend and tapping them as your wingman or your wingwoman and, and make a pact with them and say, you know what, at the next conference, at the next networking event, I'm going to talk you up if you talk me up. Let's make a pact to support each other. It's an easy way to do great personal branding and really help each other to, to you know, make sure that the light is shined on both of your uh, accomplishments. So we've talked about a lot of things. And so my question to you, if even one of them resonate, resonated with you, what will you do differently? so that you can seize control of your brand and be an even more successful and authentic STEM leader. So I'm Dory Clark. I'm so glad to have the chance to talk with you, and thank you. Take care. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be sharing my story with you today on how I built my personal brand while staying true to myself. My name is Shadon Brown, and I'm a new product manager at IBM, working with distribution software like WebSphere, Spectrum, and data science. I attended Pathways in Technology Early College High School, also known as P-TECH, an education reform initiative created by IBM to prepare young people with the academic, technical, and professional skills required for new collar jobs and ongoing education. This is a six-year model where students can obtain his or her high school diploma and associate's degree simultaneously but you don't have to stay the entire six years. I actually received my high school diploma and associate's degree in computer information systems within four years with honors at the age of 16. I then relocated to North Carolina with my entire family to attend William Peace University, graduating at the age of 18 with a bachelor's degree in business analytics. I am currently enrolled in the full-time online master's program at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University studying information technology. But let's start at the beginning. When I was 10 years old, I was fascinated by marine life. I wanted to explore it further. I became obsessed with figuring out how I was going to do this. Around the eighth grade, it was time to pick high schools, and I found it. The school for me, especially designed to train marine biologists located in New York City. I was so excited, I went to the website and was reading about all these student experiences, and then I saw it. The reason why this was not in the middle of the city. They were going in the field to get hands-on experience, but the field is like water, where marine life lives. I knew in that moment that being a marine biologist was not going to work for me because I can't swim. It was time to find a new plan. That's when my mom discovered P-TECH and my journey into developing my personal brand started well before I was even aware. Over my first two years at P-TECH, I was exposed to electrical mechanical technology or EMT and computer programming. I've always had an open mind, so I tried to love both and learn two things about myself in the process. First. Math was going to be a fun challenge for me, but also circuits, breadboards, and logic gates were beyond me. I mean, I could not tell an AND gate from an OR gate no matter what I tried. All I could imagine was someone flipping a switch in an entire system going poop because I messed up a logic gate. That was the end of EMT for me. Second thing was that I loved computer programming. It was like I discovered a whole new world. I told my mom, I'm going to be a coder, and she said, what is coding? So I pulled her to my laptop and showed her what I learned in class that day. She was shocked. Coding app became a way for me to express myself in creative ideas beyond what I could ever imagine. Just like running, I was able to control my breathing like I'm able to control the layout and structure of my program. Running gives me time to clear my head and get inspired by the nature surrounding me. 
So finally, I thought I figured it out. I'm going to be a coder, develop software, perfect. Then I entered my junior year and was elected Chief Executive Officer of Technology Incorporated as part of a class that teaches economics and entrepreneurship. I was surprised, at first thinking, no, I'm a coder, let me be in the technology department. But I was elected CEO, and that was my role. It was the process of discovering a new love for me. I love the business world and getting to see everything behind where my technology goes. Being able to take a deep dive into business put me on the path to what I like to call a happy marriage between business and technology. My mentors would always ask me, who am I? What is my brand? And for a while, I would say I didn't have a brand. I was uncertain of what I'm passionate about. And it was only when I realized that my brand was an image or representation of me and what I wanted people to know about me. I've always been curious about everything I saw in every topic in school, every sport I played. Curiosity eventually evolved into an endless hunger for knowledge, dedicating myself to discovering new passions and never turning down my curious thoughts. From wanting to become a marine biologist, to realizing I wasn't so good at electrical mechanical technology, to discovering a new love for computer programming and the business world. I realized Shadon is more than just one thing. Like a flower, I blossom into so many things while staying true to my core and expressing myself in endless vibrant colors. Shadon is always someone in neon sneakers, with her psychedelic pen and shimmery gloss notebook. Shadon is a coder, a sister, cousin, friend, student, passionate about horses, loves track, soccer, crochet, music, dance, robotics, trebuchet, basketball, accounting, gaming, photography, education, and so much more, including inspiring future generations. My brand goes beyond one thing, my brand is everything my flower blossoms into. My brand is me. Being the youngest in the room won't change for a while, but with confidence in what I do, my age will never hold me back. Time is forever changing and I'm forever going. This is just the beginning and I can't wait for the next chapters of Shadon to be written. Wow. Now, didn't I tell everybody to buckle up? These are amazing stories of journeys, making decisions, but uh, really about staying true to our North, right? As Dr. Arnold said, I will get through to some of these questions. I wanna just first introduce again, our speakers. We have Dory Clark. We have uh, Shelly Diamond, who is um, sitting in for Dr. Arnold, who was not able to stay on this live Q&A, but we promise that whatever questions are directed to her, that Shelly Diamond, who works very closely with her, if she's not able to answer those questions, we will get those back um, and respond directly. And Shudan Brown, my colleague, and uh, someone who is you know, very early in her career, but absolutely has so much to be to share with us. And I think that her story is very remarkable as well. So lots and lots of things to talk about and answer questions. I, I just want to say, Dory, you know, when I heard you uh, talk at one of our IBM town halls, I was just incredibly mesmerized. And I started doing that very same, you know, hey, what three words um, describe me? And so maybe you could, could you talk a little bit more about how to collect and, and better understand your own brand through that three word exercise, you know, and how do you get somebody started? And, you know, you mentioned asking people in, in, in your life, but, you know, do you think it should be through email? Do you think it should be like over coffee or cappuccino? Or what do you think? What are the best ways that we could do that? Yeah, that's that's a, a great question, Doris. Um, so when it comes to the actual mechanics of how to do the, the three word exercise, it, the honest truth is there's there's no right or wrong way to do it. The most important thing is actually just to get it done. Uh, so I, I have uh, folks who have done it a lot of different ways. There's actually a guy that I uh, that I wrote about 
in I, for a couple of years, I was a, a columnist for Forbes. And so I wrote about uh, about this guy because he really took the three word exercise to heart. And so in his case, he sent out a, an email to uh, a pretty wide swath of his friends. And he's like, hey, guys, you know, do me this quick favor. You know, will you email me back your, your three words for me? And that was great because he was able to get a, a kind of you know big big data set as it were, and that was that was pretty informative. And honestly, it doesn't take people a lot of time. I mean, it takes them maybe a minute or two to think about it. So it's not like a big heavy ask for people. Um, I also think it, you don't have to make it a, a portentous activity. It's not like oh you know let me let me take you out for lunch and sit you down and we have this kind of serious conversation. It really can be a pretty low key, easy thing. I always tell people if if you're not sure how to start the conversation or it feels weird, blame me. You know, just say, "Hey, I I, I had this webinar, and you know, this uh, this this crazy person, Dory Clark, said you need to ask people to name your three words, and so you know, will you do that for me? What are my three words? And that way, you can get the data and get the information, and you can start learning from it. That's really great. Thank you so much. Um, Dory, one of the questions online is, what's the biggest barrier you faced in achieving your eminence, your leadership eminence? Can you share that with us? And then I'm going to go to Shelly next. Yeah, abs absolutely, and and thank you, whoever uh, whoever called me eminence. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's uh, that gets an official jazz hand. So thank you. Um, so what what I would what I would say, uh, and I you know I advise a lot of people. I do a lot of executive coaching as well, and so it's not necessarily just my experience, but I've seen from a lot of professionals that probably the biggest barrier in a lot of ways is that. Every, everything takes longer than you want it to. And while you are in the process of trying to get wherever you're going, you know, meet whatever your career objective is, it is very, very difficult in the moment to be able to tell the difference between it's not working and it's not working yet. And so a huge issue is that, you know, we all kind of intellectually know like, oh, okay, things don't happen overnight, right? But like, what, is that, what does that mean? Well, sometimes people think, oh, well, it doesn't happen overnight. Like it's not going to happen in two weeks, but like in three months, you're like, why is it not happening? And ultimately it actually really takes a while for you to uh, establish the kind of brand that you, that you want. It's something that you have to have faith in. You have to really believe in yourself and believe in the process enough to, uh, to, to trust that it will happen because too many people give up just before the finish line. I mean, as one t tangible example for me, in my case, in working to sort of build my brand as uh, you know, as as someone you know with expertise in my field, uh, one of the big ways that I did it was was by blogging and by sharing content in my field. And it took between 200 and 300 articles that I published, you know, which is over a period of two to three years, before I started getting a meaningful number of inbound inquiries of people being like, oh, hey, I saw your article. This was really interesting. Would you come speak for us? Would you come consult for us? Two to three hundred. So it's, it's a lot more than most people think. And so for you guys, you know, if you're working, for instance, in a corporation and let's say you're trying to build your network, you know, it, it's not like one lunch or two lunches with people is going to build your network. It's the kind of thing where you need to start thinking, how can I have coffee or have a meeting or something with somebody every single week? so that I can meet 50 people over the course of a year or 100 people over the course of two years. That is how, over time, you're really able to build the kind of network, the kind of connections, and the kind of brand uh, in your company and in your industry that you want. Great. Thanks so much. That's really great, Dory. There's a couple of questions um, that you may want to answer later on, and you can pick and choose. But I wanted to just turn over to Shelley. Shelly, I know that Dr. Arnold um, was not able to stay on for the live Q&A, but you worked so closely with her. And one of the questions was from Anne-Marie Walters. She wanted to know, um, what did Dr. Arnold find to be the best way of building her personal brand and getting her name out there? And what was this an important part of the Nobel Prize process? I mean, she's the first Nobel Prize winner I've ever met. So I'm thoroughly, you know, enamored. 
Well, first of all, I want I want to uh, uh, tell you that I don't work that closely with with Frances. I work with her students, um, but I think that that Frances uh, basically is just herself. Um, you know, she's done so many different things, getting to where she is, and she um, uses all of that information and all of those technologies. Uh, to build what's going on now, and that's built her way of thinking as well. So she uses all of her experiences to form that brand. And, and that's what's made her very unique, I think. Um, and her ability to uh, speak as a woman in the field um, is going to lift everybody up um, that's, that's working uh, both with her and around her. Um, and uh, when she had her celebration uh, here at Caltech, she she said that there should be a lot more women following her, and I hope that that's that that's true. Um, <clears throat> she's been uh, through quite a bit in her life, and uh, she just just does what she feels is the most important thing to do, and that's especially true in terms of mentoring her students. So she feels that that, that her students. Uh, um, are really what has led her to the prize, and and that's a celebration for the entire lab. I hope that that's great. answers some of that question. No, that's really great. Thank you so much, Shelley. Uh, Shudan, uh, I just loved your presentation as well. I think each one of our speakers today has done, again, a great job in telling us about their journey. Uh, I know how you got the a college degree at age 16, but I think everybody listening and watching right now would be very curious to know, how'd you manage to do that? 16, graduate degree, you know, you graduated with a college degree. Can you tell us more about P-TECH? And then also tell us, um, you know, in terms of your personal brand, I know you're early in your career, but how do you want to be viewed? So a two-part question. and a college degree. It was a lot of hard work, more than I anticipated. I actually didn't know I was headed on that path into far late into my senior year. That's when they kind of, I say they revealed the story for me because I believe they were keeping it a secret so that I'd keep that work that thing and that drive to get it done. But at PTA, you're able to simultaneously take your high school classes and after you meet specific benchmarks that are set, you're able to start taking your college classes at the same time. So you have almost an integrated schedule with high school classes and college classes. And as you progress in high school, you also progress in the amount of credits that you're accumulating in college. And that adds up to the enough credit to get an associate's degree. And you also have the credits for your high school diploma. For me, I did it in four years. There are people that are now doing it in three and a half years, um, graduating college before they graduate high school. And also, so you're able to stay a full six years if you need it, and five years as well. So it's a lot of hard work, but it's a fun challenge, and it's really exciting. It's like um, there's always support systems and a lot of help around the PTEC community and the school along with the college professors to help you progress with the work and understand what's going on. Um, for the second part of your question, the way I would like people to perceive me, honestly, as a person that is willing to help and continuously grow, um, I love to communicate with people and share my story as well as help others reach their goals and understand what paths that they have available to them or that they might like to um, they might like to take in the future. Definitely the number one thing is to always be curious. Um, I'm a very curious person and I'm always looking around saying, what's, what's going on over there? That looks fun, that looks interesting. So I'm, I always like to see myself as a person that's willing to learn and willing to help as well as be curious and share the knowledge as well as receive it. Great, thank you so much. Hey, this uh, question, uh, Dory, around um, you know the three words. There was a question that we got. Uh, what if you get surprised by the three questions, by the responses? Like, what 
what should you do if if what someone describes you at in three words just you know is totally different than what you thought what what can you do yeah really really important point um, so if if somebody uh, comes back to you with with a sort of weird answer or a surprising answer there, there's a couple of things so number one the reason why you want to ask at least half a dozen people is it's quite possible that that one person might be an outlier so um, you know if you, if you ask half a dozen people or, or you you know and you five of them say one thing and then the sixth one is kind of weird and off to the side here, or you ask nine people and, you know, in the 10th is sort of a weird thing. You may just say, you know what, that's that one person's experience of me. And that may be them, not me. Uh, you know, it's, it's always possible that uh, people just have a sort of a strange lens on the world. So that's, that's why what's important is getting uh, enough data so you can make sense of whether something is uh, a kind of oddball outlier response or if it actually seems to have some statistical validity. Uh, now, if it turns out that multiple people are saying something about you that, that you really don't expect, then that's actually extremely interesting and extremely valuable. Now, for the majority of people, I mean, if you if you are a quiet person, you probably you probably know you're quiet, right? Like it's it's most people are probably not going to be shocked or blindsided by what they hear. But if you are in a situation where it turns out that you're coming across in a way that is truly surprising to you, then this is actually great knowledge for you to have ASAP because none of us wants to be sending the wrong message. You want to actually really trace that back and say, wait a minute. If everybody is seeing me in this way that I wasn't anticipating, what what am I doing to send that message? And so for the people who say these things that, that you trust and that you feel comfortable with, I would follow up potentially. It doesn't have to be in the moment. It can be a little bit later. But I would follow up and say, you know, when you said that I uh, that you thought of me as very, you know, whatever, um, what what are the what are the reasons you think of me that way? Are there specific instances that you could point to? Or you know what's helping you form that conclusion, and that can be really uh, valuable for you because you may in fact want to adjust that behavior, or you may want to. Uh, I mean, if it turns out it's actually surprisingly great, you may want to lean into that behavior and do more of it. But it's it's a really useful piece of information and something that you otherwise could not have gotten on your own. Great, thanks, Dory. Your cat was. Bouncing back and forth. They, they were just freaking out. They, they love they love the guest star. That's that's the thing about cats and webinars. They they cannot resist. If there are any agents on this call, they're like, pick me. <laughs> um, Dory, I think we'll close out uh, this session around the three words. But uh, there was a question from Kristen who said, "What are your three words that you've gotten?" Oh yeah, turn, turn the tables. Uh -huh. I like you, Kristen. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, one one thing that was actually very interesting for me, um, you know, when I when I first did this exercise on myself, like probably you know ten years ago, something like that. Um, something that I learned that I actually thought was was kind of interesting and, and 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 was a surprise for me was I asked a bunch of clients uh, what they. Uh, you know, what they thought about me and you know, what were their three words. And I heard from a number of them that they were actually describing me as fun. And I thought that was really interesting because, you know, at the time, I mean, especially like, you know, I was, I was in my twenties and I, I was like trying very, very desperately to be taken seriously as a consultant. And so, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of over indexing on playing up your very, very serious credentials. And, what I realized was, no, no, actually, I mean, you, you know, yes, you have to be credible. Yes, you have to be serious enough. But what I realized was that people really liked working with me and liked doing business with me because they had a good time hanging out with me. They, they, they you know, they thought I was fun. They had fun while doing it. And so if you are hiring someone to do marketing consulting or strategy consulting, that might be under some circumstances a kind of boring or taxing thing, but if you can work with someone you really enjoy, that is value added. That was a reason for them to do business with me. And so it actually made me much more comfortable just like being myself. You know, you talk about like, you know, authenticity and stuff like that. It made me realize like there is a real value in authenticity because when you're just like shooting the breeze with people and having fun and they have a good time, 
um, they're like, yeah, this is great. I want to work with this person more. So it really empowered me in that area. So I would say that one of the words that I got that was that was very uh, meaningful for me in that way was fun, which I didn't which I didn't expect. Other ones that I uh, that I get a lot or that that I uh, you know think are, are probably accurate. I, I would say um, you know I. I would uh, I get words about uh, that I'm that I'm uh, kind of like friendly and positive uh, that I'm intelligent you know things things like that so I so I, I strive I strive for those things those are great those are great hey Shudan there's a question that's related to this um, you know as we all heard Dory's presentation and Dr Arnold's presentation as well but in terms of Dory um, Dory's presentation. Which one maybe resonated um, the most for you, especially as you are very early in your career? Um, are there some that you're going to put in practice um, right after this amazing session we're having? So it's funny that you asked that because oh, Shudan, are you able to put on a headset? We can barely hear you. Okay. Mic. Can you hear me now? You keep breaking up. You keep breaking. Yeah, get closer to the mic so um, we can all hear you. So it's funny that you asked that because I actually wrote down Dory's um, five things to look for in my shimmery glass notebook. Um, so I plan on putting in practice all of them, actually. They were really inspiring and they really resonated with me on how to look at myself. Um, better from a public view and see what are people actually thinking about me and what reputation am I really giving off? Even though um, I've asked for the three words before and I kind of got words that I wasn't expecting. I didn't really understand why I was getting it. So I did have those conversations with people to say, what was your perception of me that made you say that was one of the three words to provide for me? So it's really awesome to know that I'm going about the right step of really finding my true authentic self from a public view looking in in terms of instead of what I personally think. So I'm really excited after this call to actually get on and talk more with people and definitely get a woman wingman because <laughs> I never thought about that idea before. Yeah, I love that, you know, wingman, wingwoman um, whole concept. and. You know, I think subconsciously, even in my own career, I've had that and I've been so very fortunate. I just didn't call um, her my wingman. I called her my Jiminy Cricket. You know, that was the person that was always telling me the truth and keeping me on course. So um, anyway, uh, Shudan, don't go too far away. So um, one of the questions from Heather was, how does having your personal brand help you overcome stereotypes when, as you mentioned, you walk into a room and you're the youngest person there? So having my personal brand helps me overcome stereotypes because I'm able to walk in the room and people know that I have the skills to be here and I have the credentials to hold a conversation, even though I'm only 19 and they may have been in their career for my entire life. So that's definitely something that helps me stand my ground and be more confident in conversations that I have with people. And especially when I'm in those big meetings and everyone's kind of shooting out ideas, they look at me thinking I'm going to be more silent, but I actually am very outspoken um, with my ideas to get them attention because I have that confidence in myself now with the personal brand that they're going to take me seriously instead of just thinking, oh, this young girl's trying to come in here and run the show. <laughs> Okay, great. Thanks. Shelly, we had a few questions about Dr. Arnold being a Nobel laureate. And um, so how do you think, um, you know, having uh, been awarded the Nobel Prize has affected Dr. Arnold's career at Caltech? And how is her work being viewed at the university? Well, I, I'm sure that uh, her view uh, from the university um, and beyond uh, is it's really um, brought a lot of spotlight to her. Um, but she just received another prize uh, just two weeks ago. So things are heating up and she has very little time to go back to her students and in lab because she's constantly taking interviews and, and traveling. So it's, it's 
uh, been a little difficult for her in the sense that she's had to change what she needs to do uh, to keep herself in balance. Um, but I, I think that uh, she's handling it well. Uh, the fact that she uh, wanted to do this video for us uh, actually uh, shows that she thinks that what Discover E is doing and what we're doing here at this broadcast is important especially for women and women engineers and students. Um, so she wants to give back uh, gracefully to the community as much as she can when time allows. Um, but I think, you know, things will settle back down. As she said, she hopes to uh, uh, be able to get back to her students. Uh, because the students are where it's at. That's what, what makes her, mm -hmm. her, uh, her, her research go. Um, sure. it's, that's, that's the fuel. So, um, but, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to have uh, the recognition, but it also comes with responsibility and also a certain amount of burden uh, because she's, she's a role model now and a representative for all of us. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of her. I, I, can, I can hear that. I can feel that. That's, that's fantastic. And I totally understand that. Uh, this question is coming uh, from Maria. Um, she saw a recent article in Harvard Business Review that mentioned that women need a close group of other women to help them move into better jobs. What are your thoughts on creating a group of advisors? Have you done this? This is going to go, we'll ask you Don first. We'll, um, Shelly, welcome your, your feedback as well. And then Dory. Is, but has been extremely important in my career, especially since I'm only about eight months into a full-time career at IBM. It's helped me learn about the various departments within the company and just having that solid sound group that I know I can bounce ideas off of or even go to them when I think something's not going the way it should be in my mind. And they're awesome in helping me figure out if I'm too static in my position, if I've gotten too comfortable. And I think a group of advisors is really awesome to help that because you may not always know when you're just going with the flow and you're not actually pushing yourself to your full capacity. So having a group of advisors that are willing to tell you that honest truth and let you know it's time to look for a new position, it's time to challenge yourself more is an awesome opportunity and it's a great resource. Absolutely agree. Shelly? Well, I really think that it's really important to have mentors uh, that you can look up to and receive advice from without getting too self-conscious. And I think that having a, a, a group of women uh, to, to help champion that um, is always important and to give feedback uh, on how things are going um, and and a listening post for what's out there and what, where you should be putting your energy to a certain extent. Um, uh, the, the times we live in um, are changing rapidly and having more feelers out for that uh, is really important. Um, certainly the, the movement for uh, um, being a force for science is important and engineering. And uh, as, as the women's movement has been moving forward on this science is also and the combination can be very powerful when we all come together and work together uh, on on the goals so um you know it's very difficult these days to get grants um and uh you know the budgets are, are been very much tightening and look to be even more tightening and so uh collaboration is really important if there are uh, commonalities between labs uh, we need to be able to uh, take advantage of that and help each other to get the pilot projects going and up and moving. And working with women is different than working with men. It's just the, the personalities are different. And Absolutely. I think that there's a, a collegiality uh, between women that can actually um, move things uh, forward in a, in a productive way where we don't have to um, be fighting against uh Thank things you. in our heads that are holding us back. Thank you so much, Shelly. And Dory, in one minute, um, close us out. Can you give us your feedback on that? Absolutely. So when it comes to 
building a, a, a tight coterie of female friends. Uh, the uh, the questioner is, is referring to some research that was just published in HBR by Brian Uzi, who's a scholar at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. And I thought it was really interesting. Um, essentially, what you know, what it's saying is you, you can't just have breadth. Like we all know that we need to, yes, we need to know lots of people, but especially for women, you need depth. You need real uh, deep connections, deep trusted connections with people. Why is this so important? I will tell you. And it's because number one, people want to help their friends. And so your friends are going to be advocating for you. They're going to be the kind of you know sponsors that can push you forward when you're not in the room. Also, friends are people who can speak openly and honestly about tricky mm -hmm. things that our culture doesn't like to talk about, like money and salaries and how much are you making for that and how Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. So with that, I have to, con this concludes our set, our presentation, but I do want to say not just a thanks to our amazing speakers and panelists, but to those who joined this discussion online, as well as those who will be watching from India, I want to say a special shout out and please come back next week for the next global marathon session. I don't know that it's going to be better than this, but you know, all of them have been absolutely phenomenal. So thanks again to our speakers and just uh, have a wonderful day and evening, everyone.